Hello, and welcome to the UFS webinar. This webinar is hosted by the National Weather Service Office of Science and Technology Integration. This, the goal of this webinar is to enhance communication and share advancements in all aspects of the UFS in both research and operational settings. I'm Stacey McKell, and I'm here to help coordinate and deliver the webinar. Feel free to contact us at OSTI if you have any comments or suggestions. Also, if you have any recommendations for speakers that you would like to present at this webinar, you can email your recommendations to ufs.modeling at noaa.gov, and we'll take your suggestions into consideration. <clears throat> Due to the high number of attendees, you'll be in listen-only mode during this event. You'll not be able to unmute. If you have any questions now or during the event, please submit them on the Google document that will be provided in the chat box. Presentations last for about 45 minutes, followed by Q&A for 15 minutes. Type your questions in the Google document during the presentation. Today's presentation will be stretched grids for Geos Chem high performance. Before I get started, I'd like to quickly show you how to sign up for webinar notifications and how to view archived information. Go to the ufscommunity.org portal, scroll down to the events section, and you'll see the events listed on the page. Archived information is, will be available when you click events archive. There you will see a list of all of the recordings, all of the past um, webinars. All of these webinars are recorded and ma made available on this UFS portal. Today's speaker, Liam Bindle, will be introduced by Lucas Harris. Lucas, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Stacy. Thank you for uh, coordinating this event today. Um, so. Uh, uh, so uh, I want to introduce uh, Liam Bendel. He's a member of the support team for the GeosChem chemical transport model. His work focuses on model development and the use of GeosChem on high-performance computing clusters. Liam works as a scientific programmer for Dr. Randall Martin at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, I invited uh, I invited Liam to come to speak uh, because uh, he's using the GeosChem uh, community chemistry transport model, which is one of the most widely used uh, chemistry transport models in the world. I remember when I was a graduate student at UW, a number of the people were using it there, that going back a while now. Um, and also, uh, GeosChem recently has uh, upgraded to you to the new uh, GeosChem High Performance, which is uh, also using the FE3 dynamical core that's used in the UFS, through, as, as implemented through uh, the NASA, NASA Geos model. So Liam is going to talk about some really neat stuff. Uh, so I'll turn it over to, over to you. Uh, go ahead. Cool. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we, yes we can. Okay, right on. Um, well, first off, thanks uh, for having me here today. Um, I've, I've been looking forward to giving this talk for quite some time, uh, so, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, using stretched grids for simulating uh, atmospheric chemistry. I'll kind of start out with an overview of what grid stretching is and how it kind of fits into some of the other grid refinement methods. I'll then talk a little bit about um, kind of our journey implementing stretch grids into our model, uh, GeosChem. Uh, and then I'll kind of finish with some considerations that people could uh, have if they're going to be running chemistry and composition simulations uh, with stretched grids. So um, first off, just for some background on GeosChem. Um, GeosChem is an offline chemical transport model. It was first described in Bay 2001. We are a community model. Um, in the upper right, I'm showing a group photo from our last GeosChem meeting, which was at Harvard in 2019. And in the bottom right, I'm showing a map of registered GeosChem users around the world. And so uh, we, 
we try to put out a new version of the model every three months. Uh, and so those updates have new scientific updates uh, as well as uh, gradual structural updates to the model. And the model development uh, priorities are kind of governed by the steering committee that we have, uh, which currently has 35 members uh, representing five countries. And we do have a, a support team. We have full five time, five full-time staff members uh, that we call the support team, uh, four at Harvard uh, and then myself at WashU. And we work on receiving those updates from the community uh, and integrating them into the model, uh, as well as testing each model before we ship it out to the community. And so something that's also really important to understand about GeoSChem is that there's a number of interfaces to the model. The um, first and most common and, and oldest is what we call GeoSChem Classic. And that's the multi-threaded version of the model. So you'd use this if uh, you want to run simulations on one computer uh, at a time. And then we have GeoSChem High Performance, which is where I spend most of my time working. And this is the version of the model that can kind of distribute the simulation across many execution nodes. Uh, and so we can push really high resolutions. Uh, and then there's also examples of uh, GeoSChem within other parent models. So uh, the GeoSChem chemistry module uh, is in GEOS 5, uh, also CASM, um, as well as there's a uh, WARF GC uh, version. And so uh, next, to kind of dive into GCHP a little bit. We are an offline chemical transport model uh, that was first described in Seb Easton's 2018 paper in GMD. And the most important thing to understand about GCHP um, is that it's capable of distributing your simulation across many execution nodes. And so this is done with MPI uh, rather than multi-threading. Uh, and uh, a similarity that we have to UFS, I just kind of wanted to add this, uh, is that we do use FP3. So there's kind of a, a, a common model component that, that we're sharing. And so then in terms of the discretization of the atmosphere, uh, our horizontal grid is a cube sphere grid. So for those that maybe aren't too familiar with this, um, this is an illustration of a C16 cube sphere. And so 16 refers to the number of grid boxes along the edges of one of these faces. Uh, and then the vertical grid that we use um, is a 72 layer grid. It extends from the surface to one Pascal. And so as I alluded to either, earlier, um, the main kind of thing about GCHP is that we can uh, run on many uh, cores at one time. And so this kind of enables us to run these really high resolution global simulations of atmospheric chemistry and generate these really kind of beautiful uh, maps of, of species concentrations throughout the atmosphere. And so this fine resolution global capability is um, it's awesome, but it does mean that these simulations are like extremely computationally demanding. In the bottom right here, I'm illustrating uh, just the grid boxes in a C180 grid. So that means there's 180 grid boxes along one of these edges. And obviously there's just a ton of boxes. Uh, there's about 200,000 per model level, uh, and we uh, have 72 levels. So uh, it's about 14 million boxes total. Uh, and so in all of those boxes, we're obviously simulating chemistry. We have more than 200 species and 700 reactions. Uh, we're doing wet and dry deposition. Uh, we're doing boundary layer mixing, emissions from anthropogenic and natural sources, uh, as well as all obviously coupled by transport. And so what I'm trying to get across here is that it's an immense computational load. And so for uh, context, a one-year simulation takes about eight real-world days uh, if we're using 900, 900 physical CPUs. And so where this especially gets complicated is when we want to say double our resolution because uh, doubling of resolution uh, is a four times increase in the problem size. Uh, so for instance, this one year simulation would take theoretically closer to 32 days. And so pushing 25 and 12 kilometers and finer uh, becomes uh, very challenging. And so uh, what I'm getting at here is that 
even though we have this ability to distribute our simulation across many execution nodes, uh, we, we still need uh, some sort of refinement capability. Uh, and that's because studies are often focusing on a specific geographic region, uh, whether it's because they're using plane flight data from that region or, or in situ uh, measurements, or just to kind of limit the, uh, the scope of their project. And so we really needed uh, a refinement method in GCHP. And so now I'll just kind of go over a really quick overview of the primary refinement methods that are out there. The first is one-way nested grids. This is where you run a coarse global simulation, and then you use the output of that simulation to provide the boundary conditions for regional simulations. And so this is really nice and easy, uh, simple technique. You can have multiple refinements, uh, but the main kind of drawback is that you don't get any uh, feedbacks from those regional simulations. And so that's answered by two-way nesting, where you're running uh, all of these regional or multiple regional simulations, and then you're kind of dynamically coupling that to a coarser global simulation. And so this is be being shown to be really effective for uh, simulations of things like ozone and, and carbon monoxide, where you have long-range inter intercontinental transport. Um, that, that is a much more important factor. Um, and so uh, this is a really nice technique. Uh, one of the, probably the main drawback is that there is kind of a moderate level of technical complexity uh, because you do need to have some sort of code or infrastructure to facilitate uh, that, that dynamic coupling. And so then a uh, third technique, and the one we're talking about today is grid stretching. Uh, this is where you literally kind of stretch or work the grid so that you get fine resolution grid boxes in the region that you're studying. Uh, some of the nice things about it is that it, it's really quite easy to use for the end user. Uh, it's a single simulation, so it doesn't require any boundary conditions, uh, and you do kind of get that inherent two-way coupling. Now, the primary drawback of grid stretching is that you do only get one refinement. Uh, and so then uh, fourth technique, which I'm going to kind of gloss over, is adaptive grids, uh, which is where the grid kind of dynamically adjusts uh, to the regions where uh, you need the most, uh, the finest resolution. And it's a really complicated technique to implement, uh, especially in a large comprehensive model. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to kind of skip over it because uh, I'm not aware of any global CTMs that are doing this. Okay, so we decided that grid stretching was kind of really well suited for GCHP. Uh, and the reasons for that is that the first is that it's quite easy to use. Um, we are a community model, so we're providing instructions to users around the world. Uh, and so simplicity uh, and kind of ease of use is actually a, a fairly important asset to us. Uh, it's fully configured by runtime parameters. Um, so you just need to modify a couple of things in the configuration files. Uh, and then it's a single simulation, uh, so you don't need to generate any boundary conditions or uh, do any, um, uh, any, any earlier simulations to generate those boundary conditions. Now, I mentioned that one of the main limitations is that you have that single refinement. Um, and I would kind of argue that that is kind of counterbalanced by GCHP's natural ability to generate fine resolution uh, globally. And so then uh, another reason that grid stretching is kind of well suited for GCHP is at the time it was relatively easy to implement. Uh, and this is because of a number of really important uh, works that, that kind of set the stage for us here. The first was um, a paper in 2015 by Mike Long where they developed the grid independent capability for GSCAM. So this was transferring it to kind of a columnar model where uh, we kind of were able to get rid of the grid dependence. Um, a second one uh, was a paper by uh, Lucas Harris from this group in 2016, where they developed the stretch grid capability for FV3 for infection, which is what we're using. And then um, Wang 2020 and GSCAM 12.5 developed grid independent emissions for G GSCAM. 
uh, which are really important because uh, a stretched grid, the, the resolution of the boxes can vary quite drastically. And so we needed a way to be able to produce uh, consistent emissions uh, on, on that simulation. And so uh, I guess kind of a fourth uh, reason that I'm trying to highlight here um, is that you can actually implement grid stretching without needing to make major structural changes to the model. Uh, on the left here is kind of the globe from the perspective of a cube sphere. So this is showing how the globe is distributed into the six faces, uh, and then that's subdivided into the actual grid cells. And then on the right, I'm showing a stretched grid that's focusing on North America. So you'll notice that more North America is a lot larger. And what I'm trying to get here is that we can implement stretched uh, grids and, and grid stretching uh, without needing to make major structural changes to the model. And so that's an asset for us because uh, GCHP is quite a large uh, code base. And so the main takeaways here are that the grids have the same kind of logical structure, uh, but all we're doing is changing the coordinates of those boxes. So a quick slide on the parameters uh, and the notation that we're going to use. Uh, S is called the stretch factor, uh, and it's really what controls the strength of the stretching operation. T is going to be the target point, uh, and that's what controls the center of the refinement. Uh, and then the, th the third parameter that's important is the cube sphere size, uh, and that's the initial cube sphere that we're going to be starting with, uh, which we then stretch to uh, our stretched grid. And so the notation, uh, for example, a C180 cube sphere, so no stretching, uh, will be something like C180 dash global. The global is referring to the fact that uh, the resolution is quasi uniform globally. Uh, and then for stretch grids, we're going to use something like C180 E US. So that would be C180 effective. Uh, and then the suffix is the region where the refinement is. So this would be C180 equivalent in the United States. Okay, so um, now I want to switch gears and um, jump through time a little bit. Uh, so Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we validated uh, this new capability in GCHP. And I know that that sounds um, really boring, but there is something interesting here. And uh, just as a bit of foreshadowing, one of the problems that we ran into is that we really needed a way to estimate the precision of our model. And that's something that's generally pretty hard to do in, um, in general. And I think that we have kind of a, a nice method for this, uh, and we were able to use this method to validate the uh, capability. So first, just to get us started, um, how do we check if the stretch grid capability works? Kind of the first thing you'd probably do is look through the code, check that none of the model components like chemistry or emissions are kind of using grid-related parameters that they shouldn't be. The second thing would be checking that the simulations actually run. So launch a bunch of stretch grid simulations, check that they don't say fault. But then uh, eventually we do need to compare stretch grids to uh, stretch grid simulations to cubes for simulations. And in order to do that, we'll need to regrid uh, the stretch grid data to the cube sphere. And that's where uh, we're going to run into some complications. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of illustrate where things get a little bit tricky. So on the left is a cube sphere simulation, and on the right is a stretch grid simulation. They have about the same resolution, uh, and this area is uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and we're looking at ozone near the surface. And so just kind of initially from inspection, you can see that these two simulations look like they're doing approximately the same thing, but it's a little bit hard to, to tell uh, how significant the differences here are. 
And so kind of the obvious thing to do would be to regrid the uh, stretch grid data to the cube sphere and then compare, look, look at the relative differences there. So that's uh, what this uh, bottom plot is, is the relative differences uh, of these two simulations. And so then this kind of leads us to the question of what kinds of differences should we expect? Uh, and, and the reason is because these two grids are going to be covering the Phoenix area differently. And that means that uh, the emissions from Phoenix are going to be kind of partitioned into the grid boxes slightly differently. And those emissions will then be processed by chemistry and, and other processes. And so we should expect there to be some level of difference uh, purely because of the fact that our, our grids are different. And so to answer this question of uh, what kinds of differences should we be expecting, I think it's really helpful to think back to the, the notion of precision and accuracy. So as a quick reminder, precision is kind of like how uh, consistent your uh, results are with themselves. So if they're tightly clustered like this, that would be a high level of precision. Uh, whereas if they're spread out quite uh, broadly, that would be low precision. And then accuracy is how far you are from the uh, actual answer or the ground truth. But we're comparing two simulations, so we don't have um, a ground truth. So we're just going to ignore accuracy for now. And so um, again, uh, so if we have a high level of precision, we would expect these uh, shots to be quite uh, tightly clustered. And back to the maps, we would expect these uh, two simulations to be quite similar if we have a high level of precision. And so we would expect to see very small relative differences. And so what I'm getting at here is we really need a way to gauge what sort of precision we should be expecting. And so uh, if we just kind of take a couple minutes to think about how we could potentially do that, one idea that, that comes to mind uh, for me quite, a, quite quickly um, is we could just shift the cube sphere grid and say a half a degree to the right and a half a degree up, just so that the two grids aren't going to overlap uh, very well. And then we can compare those two simulations. And so that's essentially what we're going to be doing. Um, however, in GCHP, we can't actually shift those grids without um, enabling stretched grid. And the whole point is we want to test stretched grid. So uh, we're going to use a slightly uh, different approach, uh, which I'm just going to illustrate here. And that's that if you compare two simulations that have as close uh, a grid as possible to each other, their grids end up overlapping quite poorly. So up here is a, an n by n grid in red, and then down below is an n minus one by n minus one grid in blue. And so when you kind of superimpose them on each other, you'll notice that uh, they don't overlap very well, but the resolution is very similar. And so we can use this property to um, gauge what sorts of differences we should be expecting. Now, just as a slight aside, um, the pattern of this overlap is kind of like analogous to a, a beat frequency. So if the difference in grid size is one, we'd expect there to be good overlap uh, at the edges. Whereas if the difference is two, we'd expect to see good overlap at the, the left and right edges, uh, as well as in the, in the center, in a sort of cross pattern. And so now what we're gonna uh, do is compare a C96 cube sphere with a C94 cube sphere. And so uh, in the bottom left here, I'm uh, illustrating that C94 grid in red uh, and showing how it doesn't line up uh, very well with the C96 grid. And so as a, a recap of our method here, um, and going back to this analogy with the target, we have the uh, first cube sphere simulation here, which gives us our first shot. 
We have our, sec or our stretch grid simulation, which gives us that second shot, but we don't really know uh, if this distance is um, the best that we can expect, uh, or if there's possible, if it's too far, and that would be because there's an error in our implementation. And so what we can do is introduce this third simulation, which gives us that third data point, uh, which we can then use to kind of interpret uh, the differences in our stretch grid simulation. And so here's an overview um, of our validation experiment. So uh, this is using that method I just mentioned. We ran three simulations. Two of them were cube spheres, a C96 and a C94. And then the stretch grid simulation that we were testing. And so these were four month simulations. Uh, the domain that we were looking at was the United States. Uh, and we're only looking at the very last month of those simulations. And that's to kind of accommodate uh, relaxation times for ozone and, and carbon monoxide. And so um, on the left-hand side is a comparison of the stretched grid and cube sphere simulations. And then on the right is the comparison of the two cube sphere simulations. And so the way you should look at this figure is the right-hand side is meant to kind of gauge what sorts of differences we can expect. And overall, kind of the conclusion here is that the differences that we see in the stretch grid simulation uh, are consistent with uh, what we would expect because of things like aliasing artifacts from uh, the two different grids. And so just to kind of uh, elaborate on this figure a little bit more, the dots are color coded according to their altitude. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, the lowest model level is in this special magenta color. And uh, in the lowest model level, you'll notice that the scatter is quite a bit higher. Uh, and that's because that's the level where most anthropogenic emissions are, which are strong sources. Um, so that's where we'd expect to see the most sensitivity to how the grid is laying over a region. Okay, so next um, I'd like to just go through a couple demonstrations of these stretch grid simulations in action. So I think there's kind of two interesting avenues to explore. The first is using stretch grids for efficiency, and the second uh, is using them to get as fine a resolution as we possibly can uh, and kind of getting the most bang for our buck. And so for these um, simulations, we're going to be considering regional comparisons of simulated tropospheric NO2 columns with observations from Chipomi. Okay, so in this first uh, demonstration, we're going to be comparing a stretch grid simulation and a cube sphere simulation. Both are going to be targeting about 50 kilometer resolution uh, in the contiguous US. And so in figure A is the resolution of the cube sphere grid, and in B is the resolution of the stretched grid. And then in C, in green, is the outlines of the stretched grid's target, uh, sorry, the stretched grid's faces. And then in pink are the outlines of the cube spheres faces. And so um, the stretched grid is actually using a C60 grid with a stretch factor of three. And so uh, that simulation actually has nine times fewer grid boxes than the uh, cube sphere simulation. And so the questions that we're interested in here are, does the uh, stretch grid simulation produce good results? And how does their computational uh, workload compare? So here are the results of those. And the upper left is Tripomi. The upper right is our cube sphere simulation. And our uh, the bottom left is the stretched grid. And then I've added this fourth uh, cube sphere simulation, which is uh, this simulation if we turn off grid stretching just to kind of highlight the, uh, the difference that uh, we see by enabling grid stretching. And so 
Uh, the general takeaways here are that the two, uh, the, the stretch grid simulation um, performs quite similarly to the cube sphere simulation. Generally in rural and remote regions, we see fairly low concentrations. And then we see those kind of local enhancements over uh, populated areas uh, as well as cities. And the uh, coarse uh, C60 simulation kind of misses a lot of that. Uh, and then in terms of computational workload, the cube sphere simulation used about 400 cores, whereas our stretch grid simulation used about 50. So uh, about five times difference in the number of resources that we were using. Um, and despite this, the stretch grid simulation did run uh, a bit more than two times as fast. And so in summary here, um, we kind of see that the stretch grid simulation does produce results that are, are similar to the fine global simulation. Uh, and it does that faster uh, and with fewer resources. Okay, so in the second demonstration, uh, we kind of wanted to try pushing, uh, seeing how, how high we could make that stretch factor. And so here we're going to compare a uh, cube sphere and a stretch grid. Uh, both are going to be a C90 grid, but for the stretch grid, we're going to uh, use a stretch factor of 10, which is uh, extremely high. And uh, so that means we're going to have a very strong and localized refinement. And so for these comparisons, we're going to be focusing on California. Uh, and the stretch grid simulation has about uh, 10 or 11 kilometer resolution in California, uh, whereas the cube sphere will have about 90 um, to 100 kilometer resolution. And so in uh, figure A is the resolution of the cube sphere grid, and then figure B is the resolution of the stretched grid. And then C is a comparison of those, uh, uh, the faces of the grids. And so something I wanted to kind of highlight or, or mention is that uh, such a strong refinement probably is um, limited to special applications that are going to be resilient to coarse grid boxes that are far away from your target region. So here we're looking at uh, NO2, which is going to be quite resilient. Um, but what I'm getting at is that we have um, this area in the Southern Indian Ocean where the grid boxes are going to be more than a thousand kilometers uh, uh, on, on an edge. And so uh, this kind of configuration probably wouldn't be suitable for uh, things like ozone uh, or carbon monoxide. Okay, so here um, are the results of those. So on the left uh, are observations from Chipomi, generally uh, kind of what you'd expect uh, in the San Francisco area, we see uh, kind of some enhancements uh, as well as Sacramento. We see some kind of spatial structures throughout the Central Valley, uh, including around Fresno and Bakersfield. And then we see this big um, kind of enhancement in the LA basin. And so here's that uh, cube sphere simulation. Uh, and then here is the stretch grid simulation. And so uh, the, you'll, you'll see that the cube sphere simulation is missing a lot of those local enhancements just because the grid is too coarse. Uh, whereas the stretch grid simulation uh, is actually doing a, a good job of uh, capturing those uh, those local enhancements. Uh, we, we do see them in San Francisco, Sacramento, Fresno, Bakersfield, uh, as well as uh, further south. And so the main takeaway here uh, is that we can use stretch grids to go to much finer resolutions uh, than we were able to previously. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to go over is just some general considerations for running uh, chemistry and, and composition simulations with stretched grids. So a question 
that um, comes up pretty quickly is how do I choose uh, an appropriate stretch factor? And so to kind of lead into this, um, I'd just like to take a minute to look at this figure and um, point out two kind of important features that, uh, that you should notice. The first is that as you go to a higher stretch factor, the target face, which is where the refinement is, gets narrower. And so we want to keep this in mind because you want to make sure that uh, you don't pick a stretch factor that's so high that uh, your refinement isn't actually covering the domain that you're studying. And so then the second feature that I'd like to point out is that on the opposite side, uh, the grid boxes expand just as much uh, as they're shrinking in the, uh, the target area. And so this is, of course, um, important for chemistry simulations because uh, you want to make sure that this uh, backside doesn't get coarser than uh, is suitable for your application. And then kind of a, a third point that I want to make is that the implications of like resolution uh, are highly like application specific. And so uh, we do kind of need a way to incorporate um, application specific parameters uh, into this kind of uh, calculation that we're going to do. Because otherwise, we're going to come up with kind of a broad stroke um, suggestion that is probably a lot more conservative than it needs to be. So I think the first thing to understand is how stretching changes with distance. On the right, or sorry, um, on the x-axis is the uh, stretch factor. And then on the y-axis is the distance from your target point. So for instance, if your target point was Seattle, this would be the distance to Seattle. And then the color map is showing uh, how grid boxes are scaled uh, at that location. So as an example of how you'd use this figure, um, say you chose a C90 grid, which has uh, an average resolution of about 100 kilometers, and you're interested in a stretch factor of four. So what you do is uh, run up along uh, the stretch factor of four line, uh, and you can see that, for instance, at 3,000 kilometers, the grid boxes are going to be scaled by a, about a factor of 0 0.5. So that would give you 50 kilometer resolution. Whereas at 10,000 kilometers, uh, they're going to double in size. So you'd have about 200 kilometer resolution. And for those that like equations, here's an equation uh, where theta is the arc length uh, between your target point and the point that you're uh, asking about. Okay, so we did want to go kind of one step further uh, and come up with a way to provide some guidance on how to constrain that, uh, uh, provide a constraint for the upper limit for the stretch factor. And so um, what we kind of came up with are these two really simple constraints that you can use. Uh, the first is picking the desired width of your target face. So um, I'm illustrating uh, W uh, here. Uh, and so if you plug the width that you want uh, in there, it'll tell you how high of a stretch factor you can use uh, to satisfy that. And then the other thing, um, the, the second constraint is choosing a desired maximum and minimum resolution. Um, and so, uh, this minimum resolution is really kind of where we, uh, what provides that dial for application specific uh, um, kind of information. Uh, so if you want, uh, as an example, say for instance, you're studying the uh, contiguous US, which is about 4,200 kilometers across, uh, you plug that W into our first constraint and it'll tell you that uh, you should use a stretch factor that's less than two and a half. And then uh, for the second constraint, say you wanted a minimum resolution of, or, sorry, a finest resolution of about 25 kilometers and a coarsest resolution of about 200 kilometers. 
uh, you can plug that in and it tells you uh, that your stretch factor should be less than about 2.7. Uh, and so you want to satisfy both of these. Uh, so you'd overall pick a stretch factor that's less than or equal to two and a half. And so just kind of some final thoughts. Um, I did create this little interactive tool for playing with the various stretch parameters. Uh, it's got some dials for the stretch factor as well as your target location. Uh, another thing that I wanted to add is um, I find that people often want to immediately jump to really large stretch factors. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to reiterate that moderate stretch factors are probably a little bit more general purpose. Um, and then the third thing is just to always keep in mind the backside. Uh, I have kind of observed that if you let it get too coarse, uh, the first thing that I've been noticing uh, is that you'll get stratospheric troposphere exchange issues. And I believe that's because some of the wind gradients that um, are responsible for separating the, the troposphere and stratosphere are getting whittled away at the coarse resolutions. And so uh, here are my conclusions. Um, we've added this grid stretching capability uh, to GIOS Chem version 13.0. It's freely available on GitHub. These stretch grids are really nimble uh, and conceptually simple. It's quite easy to set up uh, simulations as well as modify them. Uh, and then we also developed that method for kind of estimating the differences that we should expect from how uh, emissions are being upscaled to different grids. And we were able to use that capability to uh, validate the capability. Sorry, we were able to use that method to validate the capability. And then fourthly, uh, we kind of developed that simple method for estimating an appropriate upper limit for the stretch factor. Um, I've just included two bullet points uh, down here on some future work that uh, we'd be really interested if somebody were to take on. Um, so if anybody's interested in those, please let me know. Uh, and then this is our paper. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liam. So now we're going to have the questions and answers, and the questions are coming in. Um, you can feel free to uh, open the chat box and uh, click on the Google Doc and read the questions. Oh, okay. Can you see them? I can. Okay. Oh, okay. There they are. They're coming in slowly. So sure. the moment. See, one person has one up already completed, so you can take it away. Sure. Um, so first question is, you point out stratosphere, troposphere exchange issues, but you might also have long range transport issues. For example, carbon monoxide or aerosols. Could you comment on this? And yes, this is a, a very good question. Uh, this is um, very important for stretched grids. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting back to my presentation. There we go. Um, so that uh, is definitely um, an important consideration to have. The I think that stretch grids are going to be most suitable for applications where you do have some resilience to those uh, to to coarse resolutions outside of your target domain. So um, ozone or, or carbon monoxide, where you do have long range transport from strong sources, uh, you'll want to make sure that you either pick a fairly conservative minimum resolution um, or pick a, uh, a global fine resolution. Um, as uh, just a minor in addition to that, um, in our stretch grid validation experiment, you, you actually do, so, um, so again, this is color coded according to uh, elevation. Uh, and so this top left one is the stretched grid experiment. 
uh, stretch grid versus cube sphere. Uh, and you'll notice that we actually do see a low bias at the very um, kind of, well, in the mid to upper troposphere. And we believe that this is because uh, of underestimating ozone and uh, in faraway places. And so uh, to kind of summarize there, uh, it's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. All right, so a second question here. Oh, okay, so the, the second question is, do you have trouble when the grid spacing is significantly smaller than the resolution of the emissions or meteorology? Um, so that's also a very good question. Um, so uh, for all of the experiments here, we used um, GOS FP meteorological fields, which have 25 kilometer resolution. And so in uh, this, let me hide that. <laughs> in our, um, uh, in our simulations of California, where we were kind of uh, about 10 or 11 kilometer resolution, we were interpolating met fields. And I, I believe that that is uh, one of the things that's causing this um, this spilling over the, the northern boundary of the LA Basin. And um, so we did run an experiment where we regridded our 25 kilometer met fields to 50 kilometers and then <clears throat> compared, uh, kind of look at what the effect of that, uh, of interpolating those met fields was. And we kind of didn't see anything that was too concerning. Um, I think that our main takeaway was that you should just kind of keep in mind that uh, uh, in this scenario, we are using 25 kilometer met fields. So we shouldn't be expecting to kind of see any uh, physical processes that are operating at a, a finer spatial scale. Uh, and then in terms of emissions, uh, we're using NEI emissions, which I believe are 0.1 degree for anthropogenic. And um, so for those, we aren't exceeding their resolution. Um, I'm just thinking if I have any comments on that. Mm, no, I, I think that that, um, I don't have any specific comments on uh, emissions. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Please type them in the questions document. Liam, that was very um, interesting and it was very informative. Thank you. For that. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good talk, Liam. Thank you so much. Um, oh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Oh, no problem. So I, I have one question. So uh, maybe it's a bit more general about GeosChem. Is, uh, so you, I, I noticed that GeosChem is designed to have multiple interfaces, which is actually kind of the uh, philosophy behind FP3 as well. And that's part of the reason why it's been implemented in a bunch of different models. But does that add a lot of work to uh, the number of the people who are actually supporting it? It sounds like there's only five technical, five people actually working full time on developing GeosChem. And you're, yeah, you're one of the five, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It, it it does. That's that's definitely um, uh, a source of of some extra work. I I mean personally, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of that work. I think that some of the Harvard folks um, kind of do a lot of that checking for consistency. But um, I, I do think that that's. Uh, a source of, of extra work, but it's also a source of uh, extra users um, and, mm. and extra exposure for us. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I mean that, that that's been. I mean that was SJ Lin's experience with FE three as well. I mean he'd he'd help an in, initial implementation, then hand it off to people and let them maintain it. So, and that that's basically what NASA Goddard does with, and that that's what we do here at GFDL is what the UFS does. Right. Yeah. It it makes it, it makes it really fun. Uh, it's fun to work in these different environments. Oh, absolutely. And it's good to see what other people come up with. Absolutely. You know, it's always good For to see sure. other people's ideas. Yeah. Okay. No more questions yet. I'll say it again. If anyone has any questions, please type them in the um, document, the Google document. Questions. You can get the link on the chat box. You open up the chat. Okay, doesn't seem like they are coming. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you, Liam. Lucas, thank you for that great introduction. I'm looking forward to more um, collaboration with you. Likewise, well, thank, thank you guys very much for having me. Oh, well, thank you for coming, Liam, and thank you, Stacy, for uh, setting all this up. Absolutely, you're welcome. Um, okay, so the next uh, next webinar will be March the 10th, and that will be the speaker will be David Novak, and the name of that webinar is the NOAA prediction. No, sorry, NOAA precipitation prediction grand challenge. A his, a his, grand challenge, tongue a historic opportunity. So see you guys next month, March the 10th. And once again, thank you, Liam, and thank you, Lucas. No, oh, thank you so much for setting us up. Okay. Absolutely. Bye now. Okay. Bye bye.